unmute myself. That's good. Okay. Wow. All right. So we're going to talk about two major things today. One, which is going to take more time than I plan for it to take. I'm going to talk about what I want from you for your presentations. They start on Monday. We will start our sign up for them on Wednesday. If you are eager to know when the presentation slots are, check the syllabus. The syllabus has on the rightmost column what's going to be happening in the class, um, sort of tertiary things that happen in the class, including things like presentation one, presentation seven. If there's a particular text that you really want to uh, present on, make sure that you choose the date that corresponds to the text. You will be summarizing the text for the day. I'll talk a little bit more about this as soon as I um, open the rubric. Um, and so if, say, you really want to talk about Goethe's Faust, make sure that you choose a moment or a day where we're still talking about Goethe's Faust, who named some Ulysses. Likewise, uh, and the very same with Don Quixote. Any questions about that yet? Good. Good stuff. Good stuff. Things get tougher than stuff, I would expect. Bigger questions, perhaps. All right. Let's take a look at this CBLT angle 2202 presentation rubric. Now, my sort of philosophy of rubrics is that the less creative you are, the more you should stick to the rubric. The more creative you are, the more you can sort of go off rubric. But insofar as you do go off rubric, you must provide something of equal value to what is on the rubric. And I must agree with you about that equivalency of value. So, um, be conservative insofar as you must, but be progressive insofar as you believe in the quality of that which you are going to bring about. So one point is received for giving a summary and analysis of the appropriate reading selection. This is very important in this class. As you will notice, um, for particularly this class today, I'm supposed to talk about uh, books, uh, excuse me, chapters uh, 15 to 27, and really, we haven't even talked about 1 through 14 that much. And really, I'm only going to get through talking about the framework of things. What you giving good summaries of the readings of the day will enable me to do is to talk more about recherche or um, more um, philosophical components of the text. I'll be able to focus on something like speaking between Sancho and Don Quixote or eating between them or the developing relationship between them, or the relationship between writing and authors and the Quixote itself, or even uh, uh, perhaps very interesting questions like, what is the status of truth in a world that is seen through the eyes of an insane person? What is the value of the judgment of calling another person insane by someone we know to be insane? Which actually happens in chapters 25 to 27 when we meet Cardini, the wild man in Sierra Morena Mountains. Um, and so uh, I'll be able to sort of focus on those um, ideas while you focus more on the everyday. A um, couple of things about summary. You really only want to have three or four um, uh, phrases. They don't need to be sentences per slide. You absolutely do not want full sentences all the way across the slide that you are reading on. So you don't want to be, you don't want to fill your text with too much uh, or your slides with too much text. Do not want to read the text. If you need, do need an additional support, write up notes. Write up physical notes. You keep right in front of you, and you can look at them every now and then. I would say use speaker notes on PowerPoint itself, but you'll see with one of the examples, it does have speaker notes. But the moment you put it into the presentation mode, you can't see your speaker notes anymore. They've done all this great effort, and then it doesn't have any value. And or it doesn't have the value that you would have. In any case, summarize and analyze the chapters of the day. And that's the first task that you have with this presentation. Second point is received for staying within the proper length, eight to 10 slides. Many people choose eight. I don't hold it against you if you have eight as opposed to 10. Uh, eight good slides are better than 10 not good slides. 10 great slides are better than any amount of slides if you can stay within your 10 minute limit. I do not want anybody to go longer than 10 minutes. There are two reasons for this. And I think one of our students from one of my former courses can explain the reasoning behind, or at least the phenomenology of this. The two reasons are this. I lecture a ton. And one of the things that I bring to the classroom that I'm told from student evaluations is that my lectures tend to be sort of one of the better parts of my class. Uh, and so I lecture a lot. Um, 
And in terms of pedagogic techniques, this seems to be one with which I convey some manner of understanding to my students, at least enough to where they appreciate it when I engage in this practice. That means that you're not going to have much. I'm going to leave you like 10 minutes total to speak at the end. You should feel a little bit of pressure to speak quickly. The second reason is this. I prefer work that people produce under time constraints and pressure to work where people simply attempt to fill up a certain amount of time with whatever will fill that time. It's like the difference between having a very muscular sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger presentation and one that is far more vacuous and empty, though it takes up space. Uh, it's non-functional space, as it were. And so I want you to feel like you don't have enough time to say the important things that you must say when you give your presentation. I believe that this creates a better presentation than somebody simply writing or saying that which they have thought up in order to fill time. Just think about that. It's a very big difference in judgment between them. What do I say of the very useful, intelligent, interesting things I have to say? What is the most important? Then you make a judgment, and then you say it. As opposed to, okay, what makes me to fill up this time in front of this class, which is about this literature I don't really care about? Uh, that's, that produces a much weaker product. Um, and insofar as you're kind of weighing what I'm saying, uh, give it a shot. Give it a shot and see. Um, and see whether my philosophy uh, produces better results in you or not. It will produce some pressure in you. You should expect to be sort of blushing up here to occasionally lose your train of thought to sometimes feel like the world is falling down around you. But then you look at your slides, you remember where it was that you were, and you get right back to it. And as somebody who speaks in front of people um, professionally and all the time, it still happens to me, not as much and not as dynamically, but say if there were a thousand of you, and I, you were at a different university and I'd never met any of you, we're all getting sort of comfortable with each other because we've been together for a few days. Now, I would still feel the sort of heart palpitation, have the sweat, and have the blushing face and be worried whether what I say or would say would land or not. And that is how you will feel when you're giving a presentation. So expect it, embrace it, and know that you are expected to move through that. Um, that's part of the training process. One point is received for using appropriate professional language in your presentation. Uh, professional language, uh, so we have three registers in our language, and most languages have three registers, high, medium, and low. Low, medium is sort of what you use outside of the classroom when you're talking to your friend right before you get into this. This thing is like this, and maybe you're throwing some profanity in there, this, this thing, or that S thing, or, or whatever, and you're saying, or whatever, and like, and cause, and all these contractions and abbreviations, and your friend understands you because the language is to some extent private to you too. That said, <laughs> I wish for you to speak in a more public language to us. It might be the case that if I speak in a Californian vernacular and you speak in Louisiana vernacular, that I say things like, man, that was gnarly, you know, tubular. And you're like, I have no idea what you mean. And you might say something like y'all to me. And I'm like, what is a y'all? And you say, well, that's the second person plural. This is the shortest second person plural that exists in the English language. I'd say that's a very intelligent explanation for a piece of vernacular, for uh, contracted, a contraction which is southern vernacular. In any case, um, in this class, we are to transcend our regional dialects and to speak in more of a common, rare, email like dialect where there are very few contractions, very few abbreviations, and we can all understand each other. I'd say that I see while lecturing to you, somewhere between middle and middle high dialect to you. Sometimes I use some fancy words, but most of the time the syntax is pretty easy to follow. And often I do not simply use words that you would need, uh, that you would only understand if you came from a certain part of the country. Um, and I assume that many of you come from different parts. And even those of you who come from the South uh, surely know that, uh, and those of you who come from Louisiana surely know that where does Northern Louisiana start? Right? Above I-10, above Natchitoches, above or near Shreveport. These are uh, perennial arguments among those who come from these particular, uh, this particular area. All right, what do I, what do your slides actually need to contain? A through H. 
First thing I need to see is an introduction and or summary of your section. You might split this into two slides. You're welcome to split your slides into two if you end up having 11 or 12 slides, so long as you can get through this in 10 minutes, that's okay by me. Uh, second, have a relevant quote from your section, uh, a sort of quote that when I hear it, I'm like, hmm, not like, okay, you found some words. That's not really a quote. A quote is excising a thought that causes thought in others from a text. I want to say that one more time. Quote, what a quote is, it's not excising any words in the text and then putting bunny ears around them. If you're speaking, quotation marks if you're writing. It's to find an actual coherent thought that can itself spark thought. So if you read a line, read a sentence, and you're like, huh, that's a quote. And that's what I want from you. And that sort of moment is a distinct moment. Um, it's sort of moment one has when one uh, experiences that which is thoughtful, right? Um, so many words we hear, so many slogans we see are thoughtless. It is past right over us. But occasionally one hears something and like sort of a cat and ear stands up and says, oh, what, is, what is that? Oh, a little bit more to that. that. That's what I consider a good quote. And I will be looking to it. Um, it's... I would have never believed this when I first started teaching, but it is extremely obvious when a quote is thoughtlessly chosen just to quickly fill some space. And remember, that's not ethos that I wish for you to embody while you're doing this assignment. You need to find the best quote you can in the limited space that uh, you're going to be looking through in the limited time you have to present. In fact, if you have a sense of urgency, like how you feel the sense of urgency from me because I never have enough time to convey to you all that I've prepared for you, that will reflect well upon your level of preparation. All right, include one slide that focuses on a major theme in your section. Um, the more interesting the theme and the better the argument you make for it, the better this slide will be. Is the theme love, war, hate, self-determination, and Don Quixote, sanity, modernism, uh, Self-fashioning identity. Um, these are these are interesting. These are juicy uh, concepts. These are themselves concepts that themselves evoke thought. What is this? What is personal transformation? What does it mean for me to don a new name? Are there certain names that require more transformation than others? Like, for example, if I wanted to change my name because I got married and wanted to change my last name. Would that, that would require a legal transformation. Would that be a larger or a smaller transformation than if, say, I acquired a PhD and was then known as Dr. Schmidt rather than Miss? Are those equivalent transformations? Do they change one's identity in similar or different ways? And here, perhaps another transformation. How does a person go from being an acquaintance to being a friend? Is that a process that exists in time or outside of time? This is something I want you to reflect on as we notice the relationship between Sancho Panza and Don Quixote, for example. That there's much that transforms in the course of this text. And in fact, I will make the claim by the end of it that it has even transcended and transformed a genre. It's created its own new way of reading literature. Though, it, for now, just enjoy it. There are lots of funny jokes. And Don Quixote gets beaten up a lot, vomits, and you can see, I've been keeping up with her reading so far. Santo Panza even defecates, and uh, much is included in this text that is very, very, very much modern. This will not be the only time that we <laughs> witness a defecation in literature, by the way. Welcome to modern literature, by the way. Ulysses will see an Alex, too. And we'll see all sorts of typically what we would describe as gross things represented in art. Not, not the same as just thinking of, say, uh, King Arthur legend, the, the sort of ethereal, angelic space in which these characters exist, where they do noble things and fight against monsters. Well, you don't hear as much about um, feces and such representations, and yet that is a big difference between medieval literature and modern literature. All right. Include art on at least three of your slides. You are welcome to include as much art as you would like. I only say three to give you a tangible, a finite number, um, but just make sure that it's well included. Don't just, at the end, take three pieces of art from 
uh, like Wikisource slash Google images, and then just paste it on haphazardly. Make it look good. The point of art, one of the major points of art, besides having a message and uh, perhaps provoking thought and perhaps inspiring change, which is perhaps one of the most impossible things for art to attain towards, and yet one of the greatest things that great art can do is to cause aesthetic delight. Art should be pleasant to the eye, or pleasant to the ear. There is art that doesn't do that. Sort of thing. Uh, it's countercultural in that way. Like there's a there's a performance artist named something like Edward Scarry. He he like causes himself pain on the stage, like to leave himself. This makes people uncomfortable, right? Well, that's him obviously looking at the tradition of art and being like, well, art often causes delight. I'm going to see if art can do something good. Um, you can have that philosophy, but I recommend that you have a simple philosophy for the purpose of this presentation of just using nice art. Do you have to cite where it comes from? No, but if you do, I will notice, and that may help your break. Um, in fact, you'll see some art that I have cited the uh, uh, where it has come from in the presentation that I'm only going to get through a few slides of today. Um, but I don't cite where all of these comes from. Um, okay, one slide, and this could, and perhaps should be two slides. I would like for you on two slides to tell me based on David Damrosh's definition and perhaps your own additions or subtractions from the definition, how the work you are considering is or is not a masterpiece. Now, this is not a trap. I, uh, I do not expect you to say, yes, it's definitely a masterpiece because my teacher really loves this text and he will definitely fail me if I say no. What I'm looking for is the quality of your opinions. Yes or no, far less important to me than what you say to justify your position. What is it that I'm looking for? I'm looking for something intangible. I can't just see with your eyes. I need to see your thinking when it comes to this. Yes, the no, those are of some interest, I guess, but it's really an ending or a starting point. It is the uh, it is the bread of the sandwich. The bread of the sandwich is a good part of the sandwich. But I'm really looking for meat that's in between. If you want to go vegan, I'll say something like the jelly and the vegan. Um, uh, uh, peanut butter? There we are. Are any of you allergic to peanut butter, by the way? Terrible. I'm so sorry for you. It's full of fat anyway, but it's so good, so I don't care. But I actually, one of my best friends growing up, can you guess what he was not allergic to, but didn't like? Chocolate. I know. I'm getting some patience right now. Somebody just made this face like, it's like, right. Every time I went to his birthday party, vanilla cake, vanilla cake. Think about when you were like nine. Did you want vanilla cake? Very few of you wanted vanilla cake. You wanted chocolate cake. Let's be real. Any of you like vanilla more than chocolate? Okay, you're a very strange individual. Very strange. I like a vanilla cupcake perhaps more than a chocolate cupcake because of the, the frosting that, that's put on it. And I like white cake as a base. But growing up, I was jolly. White chocolate, I don't know. Put that way down below vanilla and chocolate. Also, dark chocolate that's above 60%. Too dark. Um, I'll drink some espresso if I want something better. All right. Modernism. The definition for modernism I want for you to use, which can be sort of hard to find, it comes from this article you can find on JSTOR, self a, um, a meta source that includes many, many, many journals and academic articles on it. So you don't need to know which journals are the most scholarly, which have the highest impact factor, yet just know that if you need a scholarly article, going through JSTOR through our library will get you there. Um, you don't have more to say about that soon. In any case, this is the stable URL of the piece, What Was Modernism, written in 1960. Please take a look through that ASAP and start finding the definitions and redefinitions modernism in there. One of the slides, after your masterpiece slide, I want for you to tell me whether this is a work of modernism or not, and perhaps even add to the definition of modernism. And if you really want to be sophisticated and fancy, contrast it with postmodernism. Contrast it with uh, ancient literature or medieval literature. Let me know what it is that you are thinking. A little tip I'll give you, particularly with modernism, there will be some debate. I told you that one aspect of modern literature 
this lack of presence of God and magic. Well, the very second text that we're going to encounter in this fourth, um, Faust, has a character who is God, and has angels, and has Mephistopheles, which is itself one of the many names that you may have heard for Lucifer, the devil, Satan. Um, and so that will challenge our assumptions of what modernism is, or it will show itself to be a distinctly unmodern text, though it comes post uh, Don Quixote at times, suggesting that, well, that which is modern isn't just linearly or chronologically outlined throughout time, but that there can be less and more modern pieces earlier and later in time, which I'm not sure sort of why. Um, all right, have a conclusion slide, reiterate the points that we were to have learned from you in the conclusion. Very important to have a good introduction and a good conclusion. Research shows that uh, what people remember from presentations, even from words, tend to be the beginning and the end. Have any of you ever seen those memes of like 50 words, and totally misspelled except for the first letter and the last letter or not misspelled? Well, that's supposed to show you, oh, you have an IQ of this or that, if you can do that. Uh, and I'm also a Gryffindor for Harry Potter and would have, would have this sort of Patronus. You can see the cottage industry of personality assessments, right? We really want to not know very much about ourselves, but think we know things about ourselves. In any case, that is just a small demonstration that that which is at the beginning and that which is at the end is what your mind unconsciously uh, remembers, and what it takes in to itself. And so uh, contrary to what I said about eating the substance, the meat in between the pieces of bread, apparently the pieces of bread really matter too when it comes to that which you remember. So make sure that your introduction and your conclusion are excellent. Write your introduction, produce your presentation, and then go back to your introduction and improve it. You will have noticed that excellent writing when you read the introduction. Like, how do they know everything that's going to happen? Well, because they outline their work, good writers do this, but also because one returns to one's introduction during the editing process so that one can uh, definitively say that which one is going to find in the work. It makes a big difference. Um, it's the difference between uh, having a tie on and having a loose collar, uh, having a uh, having uh, uh, loafers on and having tennis shoes. It, it is a difference in presentation. It looks like a more complete product when your introduction and your conclusion are very good. And so keep that in mind. Uh, this, is, this wisdom is supposed to help include two or three open-ended thought-provoking questions. My um, criterion for what is a thought-provoking question is very similar to what is a quotation. A question that makes somebody move in one's chair and produce a noise that is sort of non-intelligent. I do things with my neck. I, I'm like, I go like, huh. Sometimes I like bang my foot. Sometimes I'm like, mm -hmm. huh. Something like that. I've had a thought. I'm like, I'm assessing what's in front of me. It's not so thoughtless that I can just disregard it. There's a weight to it, a substance to it that attracts my attention. And especially now, I see so much which is thoughtless. Being a literary scholar at these times, I see what is thoughtless. Like when I say, watch uh, the NFL playoffs and the Burger King commercial comes on, where the song is literally whopper, 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 whopper. <laughs> I mean, that's terrible. That's really, truly awful. The person, no notes change, there are no additional words used. I mean, the fact that that is presented to you during prime time television, the amount of money you could pay to put that in front of your eyes, they do not think very highly of you. And so, I do think highly of you. Please do not give me the whopper, whopper, whopper version of open-ended and thought-provoking questions. Give me that which the whopper is supposed to be, something of substance, not what this, uh, the whopper is, which is something that lacks substance, which wishes to uh, to see in the essence. So perhaps you're a big Whopper fan and you can tell me that I'm actually wrong. Perhaps I am. You can talk about it later. All right. And then the last thing that I need from you, and this is something that none of my examples did well. So I expect you to improve upon this, is to have a works cited page, a panel, a slide. This will do two things for you. It will get you into the practice of citing in the MLA format, and I'll talk more about that later. 
and it will make it very easy when you have to cite in an MLA format for your midterm exam, as well as your final exam. Once you've done it once and gone through the annoying process of learning how to do it correctly and then knowing it, it'd be much easier to use your knowledge on higher stakes assignments which are coming up. Are there any questions about this assignment yet? And if you have more questions, you're always welcome to share them with me after uh, the class. Though many of the after class questions that I get would be very useful to everybody to hear. So keep that in mind. Questions are, are often much more useful to others than you might. Okay, I'm going to download and display a couple of these presentations really fast. Note that they both are missing something. What they are missing is the work cited. All right. So, what is this? Ah, so many books. Ooh, introduction. Not too much writing. Nice titles, so I know what's going on. Good use of artwork, and not just stuck in there, but used with a very nice format. Not an auto too. Right? We all know the, the six or seven um, uh, templates that PowerPoint comes with. My PowerPoints often use templates, but that's because I'm producing hundreds and hundreds of slides. You're producing 10 slides. Make them better than the ones that I'm producing. Um, I'm plastic cups because of how many I'm giving out. You're a nice shot, nice leader, or a nice wine. Glass. That's what you're producing. Uh, be better than I am. And you are expected to be better than I am. We're the next generation. The idea is not that you meet my standards, but that you exceed it. Um, um, very interesting. See that? that reflection right there. Ooh, very nice. Classic and a masterpiece. Ooh, interesting. And this is actually the, uh, this is an unfortunate and sad part of teaching the ancient and modern literature course. This is the state of so many of the uh, texts prior to being made into manuscript editions um, and then prior to being put into translations. This is some of Sappho's um, work. We only have a tenth or so of her work. We have one papyrus scroll um, of the ten that we think that she had. And yeah, as you can see, that scroll is not itself entirely um, entirely contiguous. And uh, this one. we will not have as many of those issues in this course because of the coming of the printing press. All right, we've got some nice questions. Staff will enjoy the quality. But what we're missing is our works cited page. Next to the one. The, on the Canterbury Tales. This one is very interesting because you notice speaker notes. You'll also notice this presentation mode, no speaker notes. Keep that in mind. If you want to use speaker notes, I highly recommend that you write them physically so that you have them, or if you type them, print them so that you have them in front of you. There's plenty of space right here to look at them. It's just something I've noticed about this. If you need good images, with this nice translation, but yeah, it's nice, it's a nice touch. And any of you tennis players, or ping pong players, when you, you have a nice slice, so they're power hitters, you can just knock the ball past a lot of power hitters these days. But we call it when you slice the ball right in front of the net. It's going to just run and they can't get to it. So it's a nice touch. We don't have the end. Like, that's a nice touch. It's a nice touch. And in touch, finesse, is a mark of mastery. So when you do something like this, including little small details, I don't know if it's going to work again, like this, makes a difference. It certainly makes a difference. It's something it's value added as it. something that you added in order to improve the presentation, is the opposite of being half buttocks, as it would be the expression of that, obviously a little bit more vulgar. But to do something, to only do something halfway is a mark of amateurishness, whereas to do something even farther than the full way is a mark of uh, great profession. Um, okay. Any questions? Now, yes. It doesn't need to be in PowerPoint, no. And you can send me a PDF, you can send me a PowerPoint file, you can Google, Google Slides. It just has to be something that you can send and share to me that I can then put on the Moodle prior to 11 a.m. the day that it's due. 
I'll say more about that soon, but excellent question. No, it does not have to be PowerPoint. No, PowerPoint is often very easy, but I think I've gotten many Google slides. I think I've had some Prezi's before. The only thing is if you have uh, animations and you don't send it to me as a PowerPoint, there is a possibility that the animations will disappear. So you might have to say, Mr. Smith, look at it yourself and see the animations so you can see my work if they don't show up in the classroom. So that's sort of a bummer not to see your additional effort show up. But it's also a possibility. Good question. More questions. All right. We have about 10 minutes, and that is as much time as I need to just say a few more things about this Don Quixote. I know that we're getting farther, farther into Don Quixote. I guess I didn't post it. That's good. I will post this lecture right after I give this lecture. It's in the other week. Is it in the other week, though? There is another presentation. All right. Well, in general, uh, like I said, and perhaps I'm making a liar of myself right now, I will post uh, things from the Monday of the week that is starting rather than the Tuesday. So remember that the Moodle site starts on the 23rd of this week. That's Tuesday. This is Monday. And so I should have posted this um, in this week, not in last week. That is a small confusion with which we will just have to do. Okay. A couple details. I want to get through about five of these slides before going through lots of these slides on Wednesday prior to our first forum discussion and our signing up for our presentation. There are some details about um, Cervantes and Don Quixote that I think frame this narrative in such a way as to give one greater aesthetic delight, as we uh, talked about earlier. First is this. Miguel de Cervantes was born in 27 September 1547 in Alcalá de Henares, Spain. Interesting. He died on the same date, though not day, most likely, as William Shakespeare on 23 April 16. 16, about a year after he finished the second part of Don Quixote. He died on the same date, not day, as Shakespeare, because, well, there are two reasons, potentially. One is that we know most likely that Cervantes was buried on the 22nd, or sorry, died on the 22nd, was buried on the 23rd, so there may be a day difference, date, one date difference between uh, um, uh, Shakespeare and Don, uh, Cervantes, right, or Don Quixote there. But, it's also the case that the British calendar and Spanish calendar were different, were different at the time of the early 17th century. And so their days were different. So even though um, Shakespeare and Cervantes may have died on the same date, it was probably a different day because of the use of different calendars put by these people. And there are, in fact, still different calendars in existence. You may know, even uh, say with the Arabic world, that there is the so-called AH calendar, which starts um, with the, uh, I, think the birth, I think the birth of Muhammad, or uh, four years after that, when he first started his mission, which we'll get that straight. But in any case, it starts in the seventh century, according to the uh, BCE or um, B, or you know, CE or BCE sort of calendar, which is itself just a secular version of the Christian. So obviously people of different faiths can sometimes have different calendars based on different major events. Um, so the calendars are really interesting. When the first part was published was one of the great golden ages in the history of Europe, particularly in Spain with the poet Lope de Vega who wrote something like over 1,000 plays. In fact, this is called the Spanish golden age, mostly because of him, but also because of um, uh, the presence of Cervantes, but also the greatest English playwright was writing during this time, and in particular was writing his greatest plays. At this time, this is of course William Shakespeare, and between 1601 and 1605, many of his greatest tragedies and a couple of his greatest comedies came out. As you like it, great comedy, Rosalind and Cecilia, Hamlet, Macbeth, Macbeth may have come out 1606, Othello, and King Lear. These are sometimes called the four great tragedies that are all coming out right around this time. The second part of Don Quixote. And so something just to keep confusion from your minds. So the first part itself is split into four parts. 
But the entirety of the text is split into the first part, which is written in 1605, which itself comprises four parts, and a second part, which was written in 1650. Why did he wait so long? Well, he wrote other works, the extemporary novels, as well as one called Legalitea, which is itself very interesting. Do you know Galatea from Greek mythology? A couple of you are saying yes. Well, Galatea, there was this artist named Pygmalion, a sculptor, who created a, a figure of Aphrodite so beautiful, right? Um, that uh, he fell in love with. And this sort of an idea of the artist falling in love with his own creation. So much that he loved his creation that, in a non-onanistic way, it was turned, it was made alive. And this perhaps. Uh, it's a beautiful idea because this perhaps shows the anxiety of being an artist because something particularly male artists attempt to do throughout literature, whether they're like an alchemist or an homunculus, like uh, Faust will do in Goethe, or, or through science, like in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, trying to create life. Again, it's, it's to try and make a work of art that is living. And you even see this in our, our contemporary science and trying to say clone individuals and trying to work on uh, what is it that we call it uh, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the exact term, but uh, trying to get the right genes in our children, and shopping for genes. I'm forgetting the exact term. There is a term for that. Uh, what is it? I mean, eugenics is a larger term. Yeah, but there is actual like designer genes. Yes, designer genes. There we are. There we are. And genes as in G-E-N-E-S, not, not, uh, do not, you know, not Levi, even though I don't think they're usually called um, in any case, Legalitea is a story about artists who actually achieves the ultimate end of art, which no artist ever achieves, which is to create life from one's own hands, not simply from one's own body, um, and not in the way that uh, the seemingly magical, divine way that women can, but in a way that is particular to an artist. And this is uh, an anxiety, you might say, that every artist as to encounter the fact that nature always defeats them from the most important part. Nature does not simply represent, but creates something real. And this seems to be something like an insuperable boundary between art and nature. Nature but represents, or excuse me, art but represents what's real. Nature creates what's real. And well, this is a tension that we'll have to think about. In any case, I said the anxiety of being an artist well, there's an anxiety of uh, uh, sort of influence involved here, too. Between 1605 and 1615, a second author took up his pen to write the story of Don Quixote. His name is Fernandez Avellaneda. excuse me. And in the second part of Don Quixote, which was written in about two years furiously by Cervantes just before he died, they find that they engage in literary criticism of that work. And characters within the second part have also read the true first part of Don Quixote and think they know Sancho and Don Quixote, and in fact will play terrible jokes on them. Uh, terrible jokes that will eventually lead, spoiler alert, to Don Quixote giving up on his life of chivalry. And I think we're all, we all sort of laugh, smile wryly at this crazy old man now, but by that time I think we all feel some level of pain with him. In any case, Don Quixote, the second part, was written in response to this inferior second part, which was written by this interloper who dared to take Cervantes' creation to try and make him his own. And so uh, Cervantes refused to let this character be adapted. In fact, will kill his character at the end of this, because once he's dead, someone would have to bring him back from the dead in order to try and represent him. All right, uh, I mentioned all of this already. Good. Um, last thing I'm going to say today before I let you go, and I'm only going to take 10 seconds to say this because it's just already let you go, is that I want you to think about what identity is and transformation is in the context of this novel and the context of modernism. We get several times that Don Quixote is from a place called Toboso or some place that we don't even want to know the name of. And so there's a, a vagueness. And then we hear that his name must have been Quijada or Quejada or Quejana. And eventually we'll learn it's Alonzo Quijano the Good. So Don, Quixote. One thing about his name I would like to mention to you, related to paradox and identity, is this. Don. That comes from Latin, dominus. Domino means lord. It is a, a, a prefix that gives one rank. But the suffix of his name, ote, 
is a pejorative, a worsening. It's like calling, saying, if you were to give me a paper, that crummy little paper. That's sort of denigrating your paper. Say, no, that little thing, that little thing. Ote is the suffix, which takes away. Don is a prefix, which adds, suggesting that even his identity, even his name that he chooses for himself is paradox. All right, more next class.